All right, uh, I started the recording here, so let's go ahead and get started today. It is to, um, as usual, you know, I encourage you, if you have questions, uh, you know, let me know, just um, type them out or unmute. So um, I am planning on doing kind of the usual what I do for our Tuesday. So um, uh, talk a little bit about the problem set three, which is due today um, for maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll look at the programming assignment uh, three, get started on it, maybe do the first task on that or something. So, um, so this week we're working on, con on uh, concurrency issues. So uh, things like um, um, our, our first kind of chapter has to do with um, uh, what are concurrency issues and, and then uh, talking about making mechanisms in order to build uh, locks and things, so some before stuff like that. And then the, the second chapter, the other chapter is more about um, deadlocks and starvation, so um, other uh, the, the things that can result from having a, a locking mechanism. So, um, so let's take a look at the problem set here. Um, so there's two questions on the problem set. Um, so the first one, um, I meant to be a little bit of a warm up. Hopefully this won't be too won't, won't be too difficult for people to figure out. Um, basically, you know, just just to, to to describe this a little bit more. Um, so you have to think of these this like it looks like a function p and a function q being run concurrently, okay? So think of these as being run in two separate threads, like in our um, uh, problem set two example, where we had an example of, of the main function and a, a separate function running in two separate threads here. So, so anyway, the, the statements uh, in one of these functions have to run sequentially, right? So A always has to run before B, which always has to run before C. But um, at any time, uh, and, and you, you should think of these statements as, as atomic, which is probably, you know, described here yeah, as, as indivisible. So um, I mean, you can't interrupt in the middle of A and then come back and restart A or finish up A. But uh, once A is done, before you execute the next instruction, B, uh, we could interrupt process P or, th or the thread running process, um, um, uh, or I guess you should call it function P here. So we can interrupt that one and go over to uh, the thread running um, um, the uh, uh, function Q here, right? So, I mean, all I'm looking for are like a list of um, statements of, of actual execution traces. And I give you one, right? So, so you should have some number of execution traces that are just like A, B, C, D, E, and that's one valid one, right? And and what's an example of an invalid one? Well, for example, E, D, C, B, A would be invalid because D always has to run before E. So, so these have to run uh, uh, sequentially. So any anything that has E executing before D would be invalid, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, A has to run before B. So if, if B comes before A, that would be, Invalid one. Um, all right, that makes sense. Oh, by the way, I mean, there are some number of these. You can kind of have like a quick upper bound if you know a little bit about um, um, about um, um, listing out all of the uh, possible sequences, uh, the, the number, all the possible combinations of, of a set of items, right? Uh, so that there's five separate steps here. So at most, um, for example, so at most we have to select one of the five to run first. So, so there's five possible choices to run first. One. So if you select A to run first, uh, that means the 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 next one to run second. Uh, well, there's there's only four left. So if, if if you select A to run first, then there's B, C, D, or E. So uh, and there's definitely um, an upper limit of the number of possible interleavings, uh, five factorial or five times four times three times two times one. That's the number of combinations. But many of these combinations are illegal. You know, as I already mentioned, um, that is one of the 120 possible 
combinations, but that one is not a legal one since um, E comes before D and C comes before B, which comes before A, right? All right, questions about that one? So yeah, there's there's certainly more than one valid um, uh, interleaving here, but um, there's a lot less than 120. Um, so you should find all the, the valid uh, interleavings of um, these two um, functions running concurrently in parallel threads here. All right, so if no questions on that one, the second question then, um, 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 our, our program assignment for this week, uh, we're gonna be implementing the Bagner's algorithm and code. Um, so um, the problem set two has to do with um, um, figuring out the Bagner's algorithm. Okay, so I talked a little bit about these in the lecture videos uh, for uh, the content for this week here, right? Um, so, uh, one thing that I mentioned in, in those lecture videos, I mean, you know, make certain that there's there's basically our textbook talks about three um, kinds of ways of dealing with deadlocks. So we can um, prevent deadlocks completely from occurring by removing one of the the three one of the four necessary or sufficient conditions. So that's deadlock prevention. Um, kind of a middle way that's in between. Um, the two extremes is deadlock avoidance and banker's algorithm, um, also known as um, uh, RAM, resource allocation denial, um, is one of the two sorts of avoidance um, algorithms that are discussed, okay? So for, for the banker's algorithm, we have this idea of being able to calculate whether a state is safe or not. And any time we get a new request for some additional resources, we determine would that new state that's being requested be safe or not. If it's not safe, that means that potentially deadlocks could occur. So we would um, deny that request for uh, the allocation of resources. All right. So, and then the the third one. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I may be having some network connections. Is, is my audio okay? I'm back here. I think I've still got everybody um, connected to the Zoom here. All right, um, so I'm, I'm assuming that my audio is back. So sorry about that. I might, I might drop again, hopefully not, but, uh, but I've been having some problems um, um, on my internet connection. Uh, so let me continue on here. Um, so I think what I was saying when um, when I lost the internet connection. Um, so the, the the third way is just to allow deadlocks to occur, and then just to detect deadlocks after the fact. So that's known as deadlock detection. Okay, there's some similarity um, in the deadlock. Um, avoidance and the deadlock detection algorithm. Um, so since both our program assignment and the second question from the problem set are about the, the, the banker's algorithm, the, the deadlock avoidance, let me uh, just bring up the uh, our textbook real quickly here. Take a look at that. Um, So, so yeah, actually, chapter six is is uh, yeah. So, oh, that's what I said. So, chapter six is all about the uh, deadlock and starvation uh, issues that you can have once you have um, concurrency mechanisms, you know, mutual exclusion mechanisms, in order to um, deal with sort of the problems that concurrency can can introduce, such as like the race conditions that we've talked about already. So, you know, so deadlock prevention is about, um, there's four, there's three necessary and then one sufficient condition that have to happen. So you have to allow mutual exclusion uh, in your um, um, concurrency mechanisms. You have to allow resources to be uh, held and, uh, and and while you're holding some resources, waiting on other resources to become available. So hold and wait. And, and you have to 
prevent, not allow preemption. So once you have a resource, uh, disallow it being forcibly um, unlocked uh, if, if the process wants to keep using it. So, uh, and those, those three are necessary, but um, uh, even if you have all three of those, you're not guaranteed that there'll be a deadlock in the system until you get a circular chain of requests um, and, and, uh, and, and waits um, um, on the resources in the system. So. Anyway, so we're looking at deadlock avoidance. Um, um, so, you know, we can read about process initiation now. We're, we're mostly looking at the, the banker's algorithm, the resource allocation now. So the only real difference between these two is, is um, really process initiation now is kind of the same as um, preventing deadlocks by um, 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 getting rid of the hold and wait condition. So requiring that the process uh, lock all of its resources when it first starts up instead of locking some resources and then uh, later on requesting and unlocking some other resources. So anyway, um, let's look at the banker's algorithm. Um, so uh, in our um, assignment for this week, we're gonna be basically implementing the um, uh, figure 6.9, the algorithm D here to determine whether a particular state is safe or not, all right? So, um, so just real quickly for these, this, the second problem set question here uh, for this week, uh, we formalize the algorithm by um, um, defining a, a state of a system like this for the um, uh, banker's algorithm. Um, also for the the process initiation now as well uses the same uh, uh, definition of a state. Okay, so uh, all processes um, in order to run um, in a system that's a, uh, implementing one of these deadlock avoidance uh, schemes have to claim uh, have to state their claim for the maximum they need of each resource before they run. Okay, so 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 this is a fixed thing, right? So this is basically saying there's three resources in the system in the um, this example uh, that was used in our textbook, figure 6.7 here. Uh, and there's four processes currently running on the system. Um, and P1 is making a claim that at most it will ever need three of resource one and two of resource two and two of resource three, right? So, um, and, and if process one ever makes a request, you know, so if a process one currently has one of resource one allocated and it requests three more of resource one, um, it would be terminated immediately, right? So part of resource allocation denial is if a process makes a request and that request would violate its maximum claim, um, it's disallowed, right? Um, so, so you can't determine whether a state would be safe or not if you don't enforce uh, that the process ever gets more resources than it claims it needs at maximum. So. Um, so besides the maximum claim for these uh, deadlock avoidance schemes, um, we've got what the current allocations are. Um, so this is just um, 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 a claim at a maximum, process one claims at a maximum needs three to two of the resources. Currently, right now, in the state of the system, it's got one of resource one allocated and locked and zero of two and three, right? So really, um, you don't need, uh, I call this the uh, need matrix um, in our programming assignment. Uh, you can infer the need matrix or C minus A if you have the claim and the allocation, right? So if I've claimed I need three of resource one and I've currently got one of resource one, uh, that means I need two more at most in order to finish my work. Process one needs two more to finish this work. Um, and it needs two more of two and two more of three. That's, so this need matrix is just the difference between C minus C and A. Okay. Um, but the other thing you need to do to for um, um, avoiding deadlocks, determine if states are safe or not, you also have to, you know, 
uh, keep track of the number of resources you have in the system um, and how many you've got available currently. Okay, so so here again, this is this is a fixed uh, this is a vector. This is a fixed um, set of resources here in the system. You know, so we've got nine total of resource one, three of resource two, and three of resource three, okay? And, and again, if you have this one, uh, you can infer the available vector V because we know I've got nine of resource one, and if you look at the allocations, if you add up the allocations of resource one, uh, there's nine total between the four processes of resource one allocated, right? So that's why there's zero available. There's, there's nine total in the system, and nine have been allocated, so there's zero available. There's three total of resource two, but only two have been allocated, so there's one available of resource two. And, and six total of resource three, but uh, five have been allocated, so there's only one of uh, uh, vector B available, all right? So, um, in a nutshell, um, uh, the way that that the the safe the, the banker's algorithm works uh, to determine if this state is safe or not. So the question is, um, is this state safe or not? Right. So a state is safe if um, the remaining needs can always be satisfied. Um, you know. So so if you ever you ever get to a, a point where um, a process might need one of resource one, but it's possible that there's none left. Um, that, that's kind of what's happening for the, the safe state here. So, so, so the, the determining if the state is safe or not by following this algorithm um, is going to be checking the current state. Um, so the way you check the state, like, like check if, if state um, A is um, Safe or not, or the normal way it works. So we're done. We, we assume that we are, that, that the current state is always safe. So we're always going to keep this, the the system in a safe state. So the initial state was supposed to be safe, I think, in this example. Um, and then, so we, the, if you work through the example from our textbook here, we um, have a request from process one to get an additional uh, one of resource one and resource three. Okay, so. Process one is, is making requests for some additional resources that would result in a new state. So we have to see if this new state is still safe or not, right? So if P1 requests an additional unit of R1 and R3, the new state would go from P1 having allocated one zero zero to ha having allocated two zero one, right? And and the other thing that would change would is its needs would go down, right? So I've gotten one more of one and one more of three. So its needs go down by one on each of those. And since I allocated another one of one and another one of three, now the available is uh, zero, one, one, all right? So um, I, I'm sure I've walked through this example uh, in our lecture video, you know, so to walk through this code, basically to determine if this new state is safe or not, uh, what we're gonna kind of do, the way I think of it is we're gonna simulate uh, just finding if there's one process, if we allowed it to allocate all of its remaining needed resources and allowed it to run to completion, then that process could just finish all of its work, release its allocations, uh, and then maybe other processes can run. So as long as we can find one sequence where we find a process, run it to completion, uh, and, and we're able to do that for all the processes in the system, then the, the system, the, the state is considered safe, right? So to do that, we have to look at the needs and see if any process one, two, and three could actually be allocated all of its remaining needs and run to completion or not here. So we've got available zero, one, one. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, yeah, so this state uh, isn't safe. Hopefully that's the same thing the, the, the textbook said because um, none of the processes uh, needs can be met with what's available at this point, right? Um, all of them need one of resource one, there's none available um, at a minimum here, so. Just try to remember, I think. Oh, um, yeah, so, so yeah, I think I was looking through the second one here where this was an unsafe request. Whereas I think this first one um, was like a, um, 
example of, of a safe state where, oh, so I think in the, the first example, um, just to step through this here. So, so here, uh, if we want to determine if this state is safe or not in figure 6.7, um, um, so again, do the same thing. So, so process one, three, and four, uh, we can't select to be the next candidate to run because they all need a resource one, but there's none available. But process two only needs one more of resource three, right? So we could select process two to run. Um, and after we do that, it would release its allocated resources. So 612 would go back and be added to the available. So after process two runs, its allocations are zero. Um, it doesn't need anything more because it's finished. Uh, and giving 612 is allocated backed, we've now got 623 available, right? So now that process two is run, we got to see if we can also run process three, one, three, and four to completion. Um, and, and now uh, in this case, uh, process one uh, would be a candidate. So once all the processes are candidate, you know the, 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 the stage is safe, although here it shows running all the rest of the processes to completion. But at this point, we see that process one would be a candidate because we've got 623 and all these are less than or equal to that. So process one could run. Uh, we've also got, you know, uh, we only need one and three of those. We've got plenty of resource one and three. So process three could run and we need four and two. And we've got enough for those. So, so all process one, three and four can run. So here it shows process one running to completion and then process three running to completion. And then, and then I guess it stopped there for some reason, but we could have run process four to completion. So. If you run process four to completion, you'd end up with your available vector uh, with, with nothing allocated uh, and your available vector should be the same as the resource vector since uh, nothing is left allocated there. So. Um, all right, anyway, so that, that's enough then hopefully that you can understand the question here, right? So, you know, the first two, again, hopefully are warm ups if you understood what I just talked about, about the safe, about the 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 set of uh, the 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 state uh, for this resource allocation denial, the banker's algorithm, right? So given this is our state, you know, first of all, uh, you need to to show me that the uh, available uh, array has been calculated correctly. Okay, so so this is claimed to be what's available. Um, this is claimed to to be the um, total resources here. So we've got. Um, um, Oh, we've got 15 total of A, six of resource B, nine of C, and, and 10 of D. So, so, so the 15, six, nine, and 10 are basically the resource vector R um, for the four resources that we've got here. Right? So, so, so question one is, is demonstrate that, that whether or not the available is correct here, given the current allocations and the uh, total resources R vector here. Calculate the need matrix. So show me what the needs are. You know, so you know what the needs are from um, the maximum demand and the current allocations. Uh, and then show when the state is safe or not. Right. So like I just did for the or like it's done for Figure Six Point Seven. Show if the state is safe or not. Right. And then one final thing here. So the real resource allocation denial or the banker's algorithm works like this, okay? So uh, what happens is, uh, again, we start from a, a state. Um, so, so given if the state is safe, uh, and then if process five requests some additional resources, uh, so then we have to make a new state and determine if that new state is safe or not. If it's not safe, we would deny that request. And so process five would not be allowed to allocate those additional resources, all right? So one thing here, um, uh, this is a common mistake when I get people problems like this on tests or problem sets. So this isn't, we're not saying that process five should go from the current allocation of 1011 to 3233, okay? So that's not what being saying here. This, this is in addition to what's currently allocated, right? And that's the same thing uh, that's shown here on figure 6.8, right? So if we allocate an additional one and three, you know, uh, you know uh, 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 initially we had one zero zero. After getting one additional one and three, we've got two zero one, right? So we're asking the same thing here. So if we allocate an additional three two three three, that would change P 5s allocation to four two four four, 
right? So that's the state you have to determine is safe or not, right? So as a first step on four, show me the new complete state. So show me the new allocations, the new available, uh, the, the maximum demand doesn't change and the R doesn't change. So, so I mean, at a minimum, you should be showing me the, the new available, the new, the, the new needs and the new current allocations. Th those would all change um, as a result of, of if we allowed that allocations. And then once you have the new state, determine whether that, that new state is safe or not. Um, and then your final conclusion is, you know, if it's safe, we can go ahead and grant those uh, resources. And if it's not safe, we would deny those resources. Um, and P5 would have to be blocked um, and try again later. All right, um, anybody, can everybody still hear me? Uh, any questions about the problem set? That was everything I kind of wanted to mention on that, I think, cover on that. Um, So, yeah, I mean, oops, as usual, I mean, you know, you can always ask questions any time here, but uh, da, da, But um, yeah, let's go ahead. Um, and then so I'll get I get um, let's talk a little bit about the the program assignment three here. Uh, so we'll get started on that. Um, so as usual, I'll start by opening up the assignment three uh, and probably checking to make certain that uh, the build system is still working. Um, so as usual, when you first come in this, you should be able to do a clean build uh, and run your tests. So make clean, make and then the test should be running, but uh, probably probably not, uh, or well, um, you know, they won't be passing because your um, work for the assignment will be to get these, uh, to implement the member functions like the needs are met and so on to get these tests to be passing here, so. Um, all right. So I think most people probably will find this assignment uh, easier than the previous one. Um, if I remember right, for this assignment, uh, you actually don't have to add in anything to the header file. Um, um, oh, yeah, so uh, we had a, a name, I probably should have called this a state simulator just to be consistent, but, uh, but yeah, so um, um, uh, we are using, um, uh, all your code is going to be put into the state that HPP state.cpp file, uh, but yeah, you probably won't have to add anything to the HPP file like you had to for the previous assignment. Um, you'll just have to implement uh, four or five member functions uh, in uh, state.cpp here. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we're basically we're not really completely implementing like a, the full uh, thing where we where we simulate processes making requests. Um, and then uh, trying to come up with the new system state. Uh, but basically, we're, we're just doing the part where we're going to implement the safe uh, function. All right. Um, so uh, we're directly, if I can bring the textbook up again, we're directly going to need to be implementing the pseudocode from Sigur figure 6.9 of our textbook here, right? Uh, in order to do that, we're going to uh, first implement some helper functions um in order to determine if a process needs are met um and then to release the resources allocated to a process um and uh, so on so you so say yeah the, the 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 three things that we're implementing are a needs are met function uh, a fine candidate process so we can implement the loop that determines can see if there's one process um, um that needs can be met from the current available. Um, then once we find the candidate process, we simulate re uh, releasing all of its allocated resources back. Um, and we keep looping through kind of these three things 
Uh, so so this, the, the safe algorithm basically loops through those sort of three tasks. Um, um, uh, find a candidate process, and if we find a candidate process, release its allocated resources until there's no more candidate processes, right? Uh, and then at the end, if all the processes have been run to completion, um, then the state is safe. Um, so we're going to implement. We're going to call the method is safe here. Um, so. Um, So let me describe the, um, um, the, the input file. So as usual for the simulation, for the simulation here of the banker's algorithm, uh, there's an input file, um, which is, you know, which directly comes from the, the textbook basically. So basically each line here that doesn't start with like a, like a comment um, or is not a blank line uh, defines um, the, the information we need to uh, specify a state of a system that we want to determine is safe or not safe, right? So the first line is the total number of processes and the total number of resources. And, and I believe that this uh, state one is the, the same um, as the figure 6.7 from the, the textbook. So we have four processes and four resources here. Um, although one note about this, uh, Real quickly, um, in our uh, in the programming assignment, we start uh, we use zero based indexing. So we start process numbers and resource numbers from zero. So in our simulation, um, uh, in the programming assignment, these are going to be referred to as process zero, process one, process two, and three, and resource zero, resource one, resource two, because we use arrays, regular C arrays um, for to represent these states. Uh, and C arrays use zero-based indexing, so it's just easier instead of having to try and convert, you know, from one-based indexing to zero-based indexing. All right. Hopefully that won't confuse people. But in this case, you know, so we have four uh, processes and three resources. Um, 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 and uh, the, the, the first line is going to be the, the resource vector R. So we had uh, um, nine of resource zero, three of resource one, and six of resource two for simulation here. Now we have the claim and the allocation matrix. This, this is all the information that you need uh, to specify the state because you can um, infer the current um, allocations from the total minus the, the um, I'm sorry, you can, you can infer the V vector, the current available from the um, total minus the allocations, right? So again, our, 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 I showed this before. So if we have nine total of, of resource zero, We've currently got nine allocated of resource zero. That means the, the V vector uh, available is zero available of resource zero. Um, yeah, anyway, so this is the claim matrix and this is the allocation. And you can also infer the need matrix or what I call the, the need matrix, uh, the difference between C and A from this here. Um, so if you look at the state here, there's actually uh, all these variables will get filled in for you from um, the, the the load state function. But it's useful looking at this function here when you start working on the assignment. But but um, um, we are just using simple uh, C arrays or C, uh, C uh, um, two dimensional arrays. So the claim and the allocation and the need matrix are all two dimensional arrays where the rows are the process. Uh, and the columns um, are the resources. So, so the first index is always uh, the process for these two-dimensional arrays, and the second index um, is always the, uh, uh, the, the resource or, or the column number, uh, but using zero-based indexing here. So. Um, and then we have, um, so we have the claim allocation need matrices or two-dimensional um, arrays. And then we have uh, the, the uh, resource total, which is the um, R vector um, from our textbook, and the resource available, which is the V vector um, from our textbook. Right? Um, all of these, um, um, we're also kind of not using dynamic memory allocation. So all of these are statically allocated. So we, we don't support simulations. They have more than um, 20 processes and 20 resources. But 
uh, once we when we load in these uh, to the state, uh, you know, you, you can tell the actual number of resources. So, um, you know, if, if we load in um, the state one, there's all, uh, even though the arrays can have 20 rows and 20 columns, only the first four rows and the first three columns would be uh, have actual values in them because there's four processes um, and three um, resources, right? So that's, you know, the number of resources and number of processes tell you what, what um, actual number of processes and number of resources you've got in your claim allocation need matrices and, and the vectors uh, here. So. Um, Um, let me just really quickly show the load state um, and the inferred state information. Just because I'll point this out because basically, if you look at this code, you're going to have to be doing pretty much the same or similar kinds of things in the task that you implement uh, in order to determine the, the current needs are met and, and um, uh, release resources and things like that. So. so if you look at the load state, it's basically given a file name and it just opens up the, uh, the, the indicated file. Um, and then basically, also we're, we're using you know C plus plus streaming things, but but it it, it uh, there's there's another function that will skip over white uh, blank lines and comments. So any line that starts with a pound sign or doesn't have anything on it gets skipped over by this. But um, um, otherwise, so, so we expect the first line just to have two integers. So so the uh, number of processes and number of resources are both integer member variables. So, so this basically just streams those in. So, so these, um, at this point, after we skipped over the comments, we're going to be at this line of the file. So we're expecting two integers on this line. So we get four read in to uh, the number of processes, and three gets read into the number of resources, right? Um, and then after that, if we skip over comments again, we, we expect um, the next line in one of these input files, let me, let me split this here. So, so af after we have the number of uh, processes, number of resources, the next line after we skip over comments and blanks is the R vector or the total resource. So you notice there's a loop. So for the uh, resource total, uh, it's uh, basically, you know, the, the index um, is the resource number, right? So the first one that we read in from this line is going to be the total resources for resource zero, uh, index zero. So we start from zero, go to number to, to number of resources, All right? So if we have four resources, um, I'm sorry, if we have three resources like we do here, um, we should, total resource should be a vector with three values. Um, and at index zero, we should end up having nine in there. Index one should have a uh, three total resources reading this file and, and index um, two, which is the, the highest valid resource index number um, has a six in there, right? So that, that's all we're doing on these loops, right? And then the next one is the claim matrix. Um, so in this case though, we have to use a nested loop um, after skipping over comments and black lines. Um, so, you know, uh, we're processing the rows uh, or the processes, you know, so the rows are the outer loop. So each, each line is a process. And then on the inner loop, you know, we're expecting three resources um, uh, counts for um, process zero claims here, right? Uh, but yeah, you know, be careful here. So, so here we're, we're just reading in the next value to that index, but, but you know, so the the, the first index for these two-dimensional matrices should always be um, the process because those are the rows. But that, so that's all the first index. Uh, and then the resource index or resource ID is going to be the second index for these two-dimensional matrices, right? So the result of this loop is to, to read in the claim matrix to um, our um, um, claim two-dimensional array here. Uh, and then we skip over and get the allocations finally. Um, so this reads in, that's basically the same loop, but we're reading in these values now into our allocation matrix. Um, 
Um, and then finally, we also do infer the state information for you, although you know, maybe I should have left this as uh, something for you guys to implement. But all this does is, uh, so this is again an example, you know, so to, to calculate the needs, that's just the difference of the claims minus the allocation. So, um, so, so we have to do these all one by one for these two dimensional matrices, but um, um, if we go through all the processes and iterate over all the resources, we can take the difference for each uh, processes, claimed resources versus each, minus uh, each process uh, current allocations. And so that's gonna be its remaining need uh, for all those. Um, um, likewise, we can do the, so inferring availability is a little bit trickier, right? So to infer availability, we first have to um, add up all the allocations. Uh, so add up all the columns, so all, all the allocations for resource zero, right? And then subtract that from the total, the R. So that's what's being done here, right? So, um, Um, uh, so the outer loop goes over the resources. So, so notice we reverse the inner and the outer loop here because because we want to go over resource zero one two uh, zero one two in this case. Um, but so so for resource zero, then we want to add up all the rows, the the, the processes, um, sum those together. That's the current allocation for resource zero, um, and then that subtracted from the total for that resource gives the available vector for that resource. All right, so anyway, the, the reason why I'm spending some time on that is uh, the lot of the stuff that you're implementing for the four or five tasks you've got for this assignment looks similar to this. So if you understand this, it'll make it easier for you to understand what you need to do um, for the, um, um, uh, for the task for our assignment here, all right? Um, so, question so far? So for example, um, the needs are met uh, it's the first task you should do because actually you're going to be reusing needs are met in the fan, fine candidate process. Okay, so needs are met basically takes uh, a, a simple process ID, um, um, so so a, a process number, um, which you know are zero, one, two, three in the simulation, um, and compares the, the the needs for that process to the current uh, available. It's going to return a Boolean result. So so true if all of the needs could be met from the, the current available are false um, if they if one or more of its needs can't be met from what's currently available, right? So, um, so uh, for this assignment, the second, um, actually the, yeah, the, the, the second test case here, is the first one where you're going to be doing some stuff. So, so all, all these things before are just testing that the load um, state um, is working, I believe. So, um, so yeah, I mean, after you initially load state one, you know, you should have these number of processes and number of resources, and you should have these values in the claim allocation need matrix and so on. So, so the, the second one, if you jump down here, you'll see how the needs are met actually work. So, so actually um, it's returning a Boolean result. Um, and we actually pass in uh, both the, the process ID. So we're asking whether process zeros needs could be met, but we also pass in the current available. We do this because we're gonna be using the needs are met in the, the implementation of the is safe method, right? Uh, so when you're checking if a, if a state is safe or not, uh, if you find a process whose needs could be met, you simulate it running to completion uh, and return its current allocations back to the currently available, right? So basically, we're going to have to copy the initial available resources into a new vector. Uh, and then whenever we simulate a process running to completion, we return its um, uh, resources back to the available. So that's why we pass in a separate vector of current available here instead of using the current uh, available um, 
member variable, right? Because this could be changing when we implement the is safe method here, right? So here, here you can see that we pass in current variable of 0, 1, 1. Uh, this is basically the same, again, uh, for state one, we're using state one here, the same from our textbook. So initially, um, um, yeah, from the um, figure 6.7, the uh, current available is 011, and these were the needs here, right? So if you look at those, only process two's needs could be met, but process uh, one, three, and or sorry, again, go back to zero based indexing uh, when we're talking about the programming science. So only process one's needs can be met if we start a process, start indexing at zero here, or process zero, two, and three's needs can't be met, right? Um, so yeah, we're using the same current available, uh, and we should only find, you know, after loading in that state, that only process one needs are met, but the, but process zero, two, and three's needs can't be met, right? Um, so. So, for example, um, for example, like so, so, how would we? How would you uh, implement like the needs are met? So basically, you know, you have to do kind of what I'm hand waving or doing by hand here. So, so given um, uh, um, um, the, the first parameter you're given is the process number, the process ID. So let's say process is zero and you're also given the current available. So basically you have to look at every resource um, in the processes um, uh, need matrix. So, so you're gonna be using the same row, right? So, so given, given process zero, you don't need a nested loop here. You're always gonna be looking uh, at row zero or whatever row um, in the need metrics is uh, specified here. But you do need to have a loop that goes over um, um, all the resources, right? So you want to test, uh, start at resource zero and test that resource zero is less than or equal to uh, this available that you're given here. So so, so uh, what's passed in uh, here is is just a, a, a one-dimensional array, um, like, like the available uh, vector, um, right? So if... Um, So if the, the need, so again, if I'm using uh, process zero, uh, I start by checking resource zero. So if the, the, the need for uh, resource zero um, is less than or equal to that available that you're given, uh, you keep checking. But if you find, as soon as you find one that's not, uh, that, that can't be met, you should return false immediately, right? So inside of your loop, so here immediately we would um, actually, you know, this isn't a real great example, we're going to immediately return false for uh, process zero, two, and three in all cases here because immediately when you check resource zero, uh, you see that we need, you know, more than zero um, um, and there's only zero available, right? So, so it's not true that the, the need of resource zero is less than or equal to the available. So you return zero. But um, if we're checking process two, process uh, one here using zero-based indexing, um, you would find that the, the need for resource zero is less than or equal. So you'd continue checking. So again, it has to be a loop. Then the need for resource two is less than or equal to what's available for resource two. And the need for resource three is less than or equal. So at that point, if you check all of them and none of them um, and all the, the needs can be met, you get past the loop then you'd want to return true that the needs are met for that process. All right, questions about needs are met. So that's what you have to do. So, and then the other ones that you have to implement um, are similar. Uh, just back over here. Um, So your second process, uh, your second task is to implement fine candidate process. This is gonna be reusing the needs are met. 
So this is going to be used. Uh, so we're not going to, you're not going to be directly using needs are met in the implementation of the is safe. Yeah, I guess there's only four tasks on this assignment here. Um, uh, but you are going to be reusing fan candidate processes and needs are met. All right. So basically, uh, I'll go back and look at the test for that. So, so the next test case uh, is going to be um, testing the, the, the fine candidate process here. All right. So you're given two things as input to fine candidate process. Uh, you're given um, um, an array uh, of, of Booleans um, that indicate whether the process is completed or not. Okay, so fine candidate process should only consider things, processes that haven't been, haven't yet been completed. Okay, so in this first test, um, none of them um, have been completed. So they're all possible candidates looking at the completed, right? So if, if it's not true or, or, or if it's false that it's been completed, then you have to check um, if the resources, if, if the needs are met for that process, right? So, so inside of the fine candidate process, you're actually gonna be looping all, all over all the processes. Um, and if, if it's not completed, and if you call needs are met, um, and it's true that it's uh, needs are met by the current available that you're given um, as a second parameter here, then you return that process number here, right? Um, so so uh, this function is returning um, a integer result or a process identifier result um, here. Right? So again, this is, a, this is testing the same state here. So, so initially the only one whose needs are met is process one. Um, process zero, two, and three needs can't be met, right? So if none of the processes are completed yet and you're using exactly that same state um, and that same current available, the first time you call find candidate process, um, it will return process ID one. And then if you mark process one as being completed, um, um, so if no candidate can be found, so at this point, process one has been completed, so it's no longer a candidate after we marked it as completed here, uh, process uh, zero, two, and three would still be, or are still not completed, but their needs can't be met. So, the, so if we again ask fan candidate process, it returns um, a flag of negative one, or the, you should use the no candidate, you should return no candidate, but that's that's just a um, um, global constant defined um, 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 you know, to be negative one, an invalid index basically, right? Um, all right, so let's define candidate process. Uh, but yeah, as you know, the state is safe. So if um, um, after marking process one completed, if we also re return the current available the, uh, for process one after it running and returning its allocated resources, uh, again, this is straight from the figure 6.7. So now the current available would be 623. So you should find that if, if you call find candidate process with those current available, that uh, indeed, um, even though process one is completed, uh, process zero, uh, two and three haven't com been completed. So it would return the, uh, the find candidate process should check these in order. So the first one that's both not completed yet and whose needs are met would be process zero, all right? And then if you mark process zero as being completed uh, and called find candidate process again, it would tell you two. And if you mark two is completed, call fine candidate process, it would, um, um, it would return three. And, and at that point, all processes, these zero, one, two, and three have been marked as completed. So if you again called fine candidate process, um, um, I mean, all their needs can be met from the um, current available, but um, 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 all of them have already been completed. So there's no more candidates, right? And we're gonna kind of be using that in the main loop for the is safe to determine whether we're done, you know, uh, uh, checking if there's more uh, processes that can run to completion or not um, for the banker's algorithm. Um, all And then your third task um, is to implement a resource allocate resources. Um, so here again, we're get, you're going to be using this in the main loop of the is safe function. So is safe is going to be finding a candidate process. 
And when it finds a candidate process, it's going to call the release allocated resources to simulate releasing its allocated, allocated resource back to the available vector here, right? So, um, So again, if we look at the way that this works, um, um, so if we go back to the state one where nothing is run yet, and we find that uh, process one was a, uh, a candidate, we would release process one's uh, allocated resources. I, I, again, and this is why we're using a separate vector instead of using the available vector in the, the state class here, right? So we, we expect if current available is zero one one and we release um, process one's um, resources after returning from release allocated resources, uh, the current available becomes 623, right? So you're gonna basically have to have a loop um, in release allocated resources that loops over all the resources for the indicated um, candidate process um, and adds the um, 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 allocations for that indicated process into the current available. So they can be returned back to the call or return back to the um, um, current available resources here. Um, all right. And, um, and then if you get all those working, hopefully then the implementation is, is safe to, to, to do the full thing, to, to test whether the current state of the system is safe or not. Uh, it's relatively simple. You need to reuse um, those functions like I was talking about here. The, uh, the, the um, algorithm for is safe, um, I mean, it's, it's the same as the, um, the, the pseudocode uh, from our textbook. So basically to implement the is safe function, you start by making a copy of the resource available vector, right? So you need to create an array, something like current available, like we were using the test and copy the, um, so, so you need to copy the um, resource available from the member variable into um, a local variable, like uh, called current available, just to differentiate it. So you initialize that. You also have to have a, a second um, array of booleans. Um, so, so again, you know, kind of looking at the tests here. So, so you're gonna need one array like current available, but you need to initialize that to start off with the um, resources available for the state, right? So, so that's your first initialization. Uh, but you also need uh, an array of booleans for completed or not completed, those should all be just initialized to false. So initially, none of the process is, has completed yet. And you're checking if the state is safe or not, right? Um, and then basically you're gonna have a loop like I've described, right? So this loop should keep going, calling um, the find a candidate process. Uh, and if it finds a candidate process, it should call the release allocated resources. It keeps doing that until find candidate process returns no candidate, right? And then at the end, um, uh, you need to return true or false, right? So at the end, you're gonna be looking at the um, um, completed array, right? So if all of the uh, processes in your completed array, the Boolean uh, values, if they're all true, then you're gonna return true. Uh, but if one or more processes are not completed, so if, if you ch if you check through the completed uh, Boolean array and you find one that's false still, the answer should be false, um, that the state is not safe. Um, all right, questions? Yeah, I mean, if you look at that, basically then the, the, the tests for the task four are relatively simple. So the uh, the um, the state in, in the file for state one was the one from our textbook, but that is a safe state. Uh, but the one in state two is, should, should, be, should, should be an unsafe state. So if you implement is safe correctly, you should return false. 
I should say that's not safe. And state three is, is, is a safe state, so it returns true. And state four is, is not safe. Um, and I can talk more about, I'll, I'll talk, although we've covered quite a bit of this here, so we'll, we'll see if people have questions on um, our next class meeting on Thursday or not when the assignment is due. Uh, there's a little bit more we could say about the state. Um, um, yeah, again, I, I think that this uh, assignment is going to be um, easier for most people than assignment two. Um, so, so you, you don't probably don't have to do anything actually to get the system test passing as well, as long as you've got the is safe and the all and the other methods working correctly passing the unit tests, you're most likely should be passing um, all the system tests as well at that point. Um, all right, uh, anybody have any questions about that or the problem set they want to ask before we wrap up here for today? No, nope, last chance. All right. Um, well, good luck on that. You know, send, me, send me questions by email if you think of stuff while you're working on things. Um, other, otherwise, I think we had everybody online here today, but uh, I'll go ahead and post this as usual in case you want to review it. Um, I'll see you guys later.